Welcome to Legacy Cast, your source for hearing from top influencers, industry experts, and successful business owners who are telling their unique story about life, values, goals, business strategies, and the various causes they are so passionate about. Future generations will come to be impacted by what is happening today, whether positive or negative, and our mission is to focus on what is going to affect change for the better. Hosted each weekday by James Snow, a former U.S. Army combat medic, now founder and principal advisor of James Advisors Group, a full-service financial planning firm in North Texas. This is Legacy Cast. Welcome to Legacy Cast listeners. This is your host, James Snow, coming to you from North Texas. And, you know, we, we're enjoying this December weather here in Texas. You know, a little bit cooler, finally. We're typically up between uh, 70 and 130 in Texas, but we're actually down south of that temperature, I guess in the 50s now. So you know, we're enjoying a little bit of the, the winter time. And I have a, a very wonderful guest with me today, uh, Rob Brayman. Uh, I hope I'm not butchering his last name too much there. Uh, but uh, he's a Special Forces vet, veteran, which is why I say I hope I'm not butchering it too much because he'll, he'll come and take me out. Uh, but uh, he's he's got a, a lot of really good uh, good things that he's got going on, different uh, organizations that he's connected with, um, head of a uh, Inc. 5000 uh, or Inc. 500, Inc. 1000 uh, business. So uh, without further ado and further babble, let me just uh, welcome Rob onto the program. Welcome, my friend. James, thanks for having me. It's truly a privilege. Well, it's a pleasure and honor to have you on the program. And uh, Rob, you know, as as the, the program you know, would imply with Legacy Cast, you know, we, we like to talk about what people are doing in their world. Uh, that's going to to impact other people, and you know that for some people, you know, you can ask a hundred individuals, and you'll get a hundred different answers. You're you're going to hear, you know, maybe it's an educational legacy that somebody's involved in. Uh, is it a financial legacy? Is is it the business that they want to leave to their children, their grandchildren? But whatever whatever you know that definition is, uh, ultimately it's people telling their story their way, so that many generations from now know what you cared about, what you're involved in. And what you did to make the world better, and and so with that, uh, when you hear uh, legacy, what, what's the first thing that comes to your mind personally? So I, cogent, and I say I. Let me be let me be fair when I answer this question. I've built an organization that one of the major things that we work through is organizational successorship mm-hmm. with our clients. Um, but but let me ask the answer the question more directly, seeing as how you're asking me as the senior partner, uh, managing director of coaching analytics. And I will tell you that, that what I teach my current group, and we've grown from, you know, six to north of 130 people in four and a half years, is, is that the greatness of our, our firm, our company, isn't because Rob Brayman had some amazing idea. Um, I will tell you that that the greatest legacy I view in coach and analytics is the fact that other people have not just embraced the vision that I, I laid out some four and a half years ago, but they've embraced it so much so that they've made it their own and candidly made it better, which I think is the mark of an organizationally um, organically grown or organizationally sound and organically grown organization. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's critical, right? It's not very rarely for entrepreneurs is the success of their organization solely defined by their own abilities and aptitudes. If they right. do it right, their organization and the success thereof should be defined by how many people they've been able to affect in a positive way where people have embraced what the organization stands for and more importantly, how to make that vision better. And for me, that's the greatest legacy is that I. As, I, as I'm 52 years old and I look onto the future of Cogent Analytics, even in, a, in the massive growth curve that we've had, I'd say that we are thinking about that legacy question. And as part of our, part of our internal conversations mm-hmm. frequently of how do we develop an organization that ultimately removes us from the equation that is ongoing. If I'm hit by a truck tomorrow, mm-hmm. does Cogent Analytics survive? And I would say full, full-throatedly that that Cogent Analytics now is a 
has an opportunity to be a legacy organization. So sorry, very long answer to a short question. And, and I like how you're putting that, you know, you're touching on several different points that, you know, at least, you know, within, within my world is, is something that's very important because you know, you're talking about, you know, the succession of your company. And, you know, that, that's a huge conversation that everyone that's the head of an organization needs to think about. Unfortunately, so many don't. And, and so it's you know, a company of your, of your size and position. You know, and, you know, with that note, I'd, I'd like to say, you know, congratulations on the kind of growth you've had in, in four years. That, that's, that's pretty substantial. But, you know, a company of your size and, and the, the accomplishments that you've had, you, know, you would really need to have that kind of a, a thinking, you know, the, the multi-generational kind of thinking to where, like you said, something happens to you tomorrow and your company is going to be okay because those 130 some odd employees also represents 130 some odd families. And so the number of lives that are impacted by the fact that you're still around, you know, business wise, even if you Rob are not still around, that's huge because, you know, that, that could be 500 people, you know, 500 lives affected by whether or not they still have a job. So James, I'll give you some, uh, if you'll, if you'll give me some latitude, I want to exponentialize that for you mm -hmm. because we are in service to others. Our organization represents the American small business owner mm -hmm. and that whether you're talking about business development, organizational engineering, operational efficiency, measurements, KPIs, financial right. planning, strategic planning, all of these things that we've done on behalf of our clients over that four and a half years, that number all of a sudden becomes thousands right. of people sure. because it's not just the clients we represent. It's their wives and kids. It's their mm -hmm. employees, wives and kids. So when I look at sphere of influence and I think about the legacy of cogent analytics, it becomes critically important that we are acutely aware of it every day. So right. it, 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 it's, I think it's a great first question to open up our discussion with because it is, part of our culture right. as to the impact not only that we have daily in our directorship but more importantly the the service that we do on behalf of our clients mm -hmm. and uh, i'm glad that you mentioned that part because so many people don't also think of maybe the the impact that perhaps your your vendors and your service providers that work with your company yeah you know, they rely they rely on those contracts and so then you're looking at the number of lives within each of those businesses and the size of their families and then their service providers and vendors. So it, it just becomes a snowball effect, you know, pardon the pun. Uh, it, it just becomes a snowball effect of, you know, how many layers out you can go and just how many people are affected. And, and so we, we can't think of just, you know, it's just me, spouse and my kids. You know, it's, it's all of those other lives that are intertwined into this web of, of influence. And most small business owners, most entrepreneurs, people don't, people always say, hey, you know, you, you work for yourself. You, mm -hmm. You've got a job. Where in reality, the American small business owner works for Uncle Sam because he's got to pay his taxes before he gets paid. Yep. He's got to work for the bank because the bank is, I've got to service my debt to the bank. Mm -hmm. He's got to work to it for his vendors who sold them goods to be able to offer their services under the world. And then... I always say firstly, but I always leave it last in the discussion, but most small business owners, if you sit down at a dinner party or you're sitting down and having a beer, you're playing golf, nine out of 10 of them will tell you that their employees are the most important thing in their life and that they want to offer their employees an opportunity for a future. They want to offer their employees an opportunity for growth. They want to offer their employees an opportunity for safety and security. Yeah. So when you meet that small business owner out there in the world and you, and you say to them, Hey, you work for yourself. Uh, almost all of them are saying to themselves, well, it sounds nice, but that's really not how it works. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but the key message there is, you know, a small business owner, an entrepreneur very much embraces their obligation to, to how their decisions impact the, their employees. And then, you know, one step beyond. And I know that because I've been representing them for a very, very long time. And the, the best part of the entrepreneur is that it comes from the heart. You know, these are, these are good, hardworking, down to earth, solid Americans that believe in what they're doing, how they're doing it, where they're going. Most often they do not 
have all the right tools or the right strategy or right circumstance. It's kind of like living in your forest every day, but I can tell you that their core value system is sound and their spirit to succeed is bar none, which is the thing that inspires me the most, right? Is that, Mm -hmm. is that desire for excellence that a small business owner approaches their world with. Yeah, very well, very well said. So uh, kind of from what I'm hearing here, uh, do you feel like it's important that people actively consider what they're doing on a day-to-day basis that's going to impact that legacy, both on their personal level, within their family, and then also within a business level? If, if you do legacy correctly, it, it's not that it's an active thought. It more becomes a cultural thought. So if you incorporate the future and legacy of your company into your strategic planning efforts, which begin to start taking shape in September, October, November of each preceding year. Mm-hmm. The, the whole purpose of those strategic planning endeavors is to ensure that you're looking at your organization as to what it's going to be. And legacy has to be part of that dialogue. So I hate to back into the question on you that way, but I think it's critically important that legacy is part of that discussion because that's what secures the safety and longevity of your company. Um, but I, I think you back into it in that that becomes more of a culture issue as opposed to a planned dialogue issue. Yeah. And, and I like that you brought that up because when, when I'm speaking with people, especially, you know, my clients within my business uh, setting, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to them, you know, from the aspect that, you know, to me, legacy is more of a lifestyle. You know, once you've done it correctly, you know, it, it becomes, you know, it's all encompassing everything that you do on some level, is going to impact your legacy because every decision that you make is going to impact it either in a positive or negative way. And so, Amen. you know, when, when we're doing things, you're making a decision, you know, are we going to have that, that last drink, you know, when we're out with buddies, you know, that could make a poor decision to your legacy, or are we going to make that business you know, decision, you know, during a business meeting, you know, that could make a poor or positive decision. And so we kind of have to look at it as a, a lifestyle, if you will, that everything that we do is going to impact something else and someone else. And so are we doing the right thing? And are we, are we living a good existence, a good life, a good example for other people so that we're creating a good legacy. And in turn, we're helping those other people that we touch and that we are imparting into that we're helping them build their legacy. So like I said, I would, it becomes a and I was going to say, God willing, they then right. exponentialize that best practice on mm-hmm. in their life. So I'm, I'm right there with you. Yeah. Cause ultimately that's what it's all about. You know, we're, we're put here with the purpose of leaving the world better than we found it. And, and so, you know, in my book, that's, that's really where, where I come in with, you know, when, I, when I make that decision of, am I going to take this course of action is, is it going to leave the world better? Am I going to leave other people better? And how am I going to answer this when I get to that point, you know, after my life is over and I'm answering for all that I've done, you know, how am I going to answer that? hundred percent agree. So when you're looking at um, your views of legacy and, and also your plans uh, within your business, uh, how does, how do legacy decisions play a role in your company? Um, <clears throat> so we do, we strategically plan in each one of our departments mm-hmm. and then as a collective, as a group of directors. And one of the exercises we do is we do a collective here's where we were. So we look in the rear view mirror. That way we can look at statistical performance against plan from last year. Mm -hmm. And then we begin to lay those things out and the entire group goes through the pre-planning phase, which really is an outline and a trend analysis against what we did. Mm -hmm. And then each of the directors go back amongst their team and they come back. So one of the challenges that I always have with each one of the directors or department heads is what legacy, interesting that you asked me that question, what legacy do you believe your efforts have now left in your rear view mirror? Because legacy can be future looking, but it's how you control things to get to when you look back in the rear view mirror that you can say, I've accomplished the things that I set out to do with my team that is the best legacy is the foundation that you're building and where you're going. And that's something I say to them with great frequency. So when you and I start having a legacy discussion, I I think it's wholly apropos 
because that goes to my core beliefs. I think that everybody has to be thinking about the impact of how your decisions are going to be made today because most often the ripple effect and the profoundness of their impact carries themselves well well beyond the one minute it took you to accomplish the deed. Sure. So the deed has to require some level of forethought, hence legacy enters the discussion. Yep, and, and I'm like I'm glad that you mentioned the the analogy of the ripple effect because you know it's so easy to visualize you know you throw a, a pebble into the pond and it creates those ripples, and the ripples are going to continue all the way across to the other side you know to the other bank, and that's exactly how our actions and decisions today are going to affect things tomorrow and years from now is those ripples keep continuing. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that, you know, within your business that you're, you're having those kinds of conversations to where people are, are empowered to think that way, because that's going to make them better leaders, better community members, better, you know, better family members, better husbands, wives, parents, you know, and so forth. It's, it's going to create better individuals. And my greatest hope for us as a team is that I then push legacy on to folks to embrace what legacy are you going to have with your client. So not only do I look at internally, inwardly, Mm -hmm. I try to get people to embrace the concept as they look outwardly to the services we provide for our clients. Mm -hmm. So there should be an acute awareness of anybody who's in service to others that your actions have an immediate impact as well as a long, a more long lasting impact called your legacy. So the real question is, did you do your best? Did you get buy in? Mm -hmm. Can the client replicate it? And now can they build off of the foundations that you've put in place? Sometimes we introduce very tough new concepts. And sometimes what we're doing is tightening down the system or structure that they've already developed. Sure. But we will build a trend analysis with a client. We'll see a client that's underperforming. Um, and, you know, in American small business, a lot of times what you have is companies that are doing very, very well, but they're underperforming from a net profitability or a cash right. liquidity standpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know you don't want me to go into a long geek out session about cash or liquidity today, but the impact to legacy is when we implement those tools on behalf of the client, if you don't make it durable, if it's not long lasting, if the team hasn't not just embraced it, but, but they've, they've gobbled it up, they've embraced it and now they've made it better. Now, you know, you have a legacy. So that's the context in which I use with my team. Um, Because I think that, I think you're right. I think impacts are a ripple. I think impacts are both immediate and exceptionally long term. True. Now, as a a business owner, you know, CEO and entrepreneur, uh, are there a few things that that still, you know, four years in that are still keeping you up at night about your business, about growing your business, scaling and so forth? So we were no different. You know, it's interesting. I teach this every day. And I would say even as and it, April 22nd will be the, the fifth anniversary for us. And I would tell you that when you grow from six founding participants in Cogent Analytics to 130 plus in four and a half years that we're going to suffer from some of the same challenges that our clients do. Mm -hmm. Um, Occasionally I will promote somebody into a role that was less successful than I would have hoped them to be. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I promote somebody or don't promote somebody in in a role that in reflection probably would have been a better choice. I think where I differ because I represent others in these behaviors is that we're very aggressive about evaluating performance, evaluating behavior, understanding what the challenges to growth are, understanding when we're getting dilution in either message or performance of particular task, base level or more complex level. So yeah, I would say that those things still, you know, I would say two things. One, human resource development, which is probably the same thing for your listeners Mm -hmm. is something that I think about very, very frequently. And then number two, which is, uh, I guess it goes more to my core. I've had a, I've had a statement I've said to people, everybody always asks me, well, how big do you want to get and how fast do you want to get there? And I really don't care about either of those two answers. I, I don't care how big coach analytics get. I will get as big as a great consultancy can be as long as we don't dilute our service offering to our clients and how fast 
see answer number one. You know, it's, it, it's not an ego decision for me. It's a client based or a client based organization. So when I stay up at night, as you make mention of that question, am I developing the right people? But more importantly, am I, am I earning the right to represent our clients through best in class mm. representation? And that, that to me is always going to keep me, I think I'm going to be 75 years old, James, and I'll, I'll probably still be staying up at night, making sure that we have not diluted that service offering for our clients because, because they need us. It's pretty critical. Yep. So yeah, there, there are some groups out there that uh, I always say that they are more worried about the build hour, or the cash they're going to collect than the the true client representation, which is an honor to begin with. Sure. Um, so we're the other way around. I don't, I don't care about the build hour. I care about the right kind of representation. And if we're successful, then clients will tell our story. And uh, that has held true over the last four and a half years. And I'd like to believe it's going to hold true as we continue to mature. Yeah, I, I certainly um, subscribe to uh, Zig Ziglar's viewpoint on, you know, when you're helping enough people, you're going to be okay. And so that, that's really how, you know, especially in the service industries that we're in, you know, if when you're able to, to bless enough people, then you in turn are going to be blessed in the process. So you don't have to worry about how much money you're making or how quickly you, you have that growth because you help enough people and the other things will, will resolve themselves. So they do. you don't have to worry about, you know, the, the obvious that, that the worldly greedy business person would look at, you know, just focus on being a servant and serve enough people. And in the end, you know, you're, you're always taken care of. So it's, it all kind of, I absolutely adds. agree with that, James. I, I've, I've given that, um, I've had that discussion amongst this team and mm -hmm. I've watched other team members on this team give that discussion with others. So at least I know it's cool. I know it's part of our core value system, which is as you, it's just cool. So it is. <clears throat> now I uh, kind of in a slight uh, change of gears here. Uh, now I think I pretty much know the answer to this, but you know, it's sort of one of those um, rhetorical questions that I like to throw in. Uh, do you believe it's important that people uh, create within their business business plans, financial plans, and other key strategies? Or do you, do you think that it's acceptable for them to, to effectively fly by the seat of their pants? Oh my gosh, I'm a business geek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm a diehard geek. I, I, I don't think you know where you're going unless you plan how to get there. Yep. You know, I go, I always equate it. I always equate it back to trying to navigate on a topographical map. If you don't plot your course, you're going to end up in the midst of, uh, in the midst of some thickets. Yeah. So I, I'm a big proponent that business kind of works the same way. It, you gotta, you gotta shoot your azimuth and know where you're going and you got to count your paces to get there. Right. So you know that when you've arrived, you, you have managed to an outcome that you planned before you got to that point on the map. Uh, so I hope everybody appreciates my metaphor, but let me simply make this put. Whether it's a, a strategic plan in financial or profit engineering, mm -hmm. you cannot effectively manage to engineered profit and manage to a liquidity ratio to pay Uncle Sam, to pay the bank, to, to pay for growth because growth costs money and end up with a residual amount left over at the end of the year called a distribution mm -hmm. beyond tax consequence, which is really how small business owners get paid. Adara, you have a number of listeners listening today that have had great successes this year and there's nothing left in the bank. Right. I would make the argument that there's nothing left in the bank because it is not as controlled for outstanding of an effort that you put forth this year. You're not supposed to get to the end of the year. And please keep in mind, this is not about greed. This is how you fund your retirement. This is how you fund your kid's education. This is how you build the equity value because your company is likely the single largest contributor to your retirement program. So many things are affected by how you plan and how you execute that your answer to should you fly by your seat of your pants, uh, I've got one word, never. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and you, you, you made a, a good correlation there is when you're talking about, you know, the the money at the end of the year funding things like retirement, you know, that, that also applies, you know, for your employees because, you know, Amen. hopefully you're going to have you know, an employee contribution plan that you're doing some matching for so that you're you're putting into that loyalty 
thing that keeps your employees with you for you know 10 15 20 years and not just two or three like so many companies deal with well even if you want to modify their behavior during the year the employee has to see the vision they've got to participate in why profit's important on a job, not just because I'm filling your pockets, but I'm a contributor to the success. Mm -hmm. And I understand what the net benefit is in the form of incentivization, right. because incentives for all intents and purposes is incenting performance based on profit targets being accomplished. Right. So you're not giving them something, you know, which, and I, do you mind if I tell a little anecdotal story? Go for it. So I had a client tell me, you know, well, I, I pay him enough. I don't want to give him any more. Now, this is a client that was operating at 2% profit. And what he was really saying was, I don't have enough money left over at the end of the year to pay my employees more. I'm not even getting a paycheck myself. Nothing substantive. Mm -hmm. The client was making about 100 grand a year. Once I got him to realize that part of the reason behind the lack of profitability was due to the lack of control and the lack of employee buy-in, once we created an incentive program where he understood that they weren't getting more money, for lack of better words, out of money that wasn't existing, mm -hmm. what they were doing is now changing how they participated in the work product that the company was delivering, right. and the employee had a vested interest in doing it well and doing it to a profit standard. So at the end of the year, when the company made 10%, there was obviously ample enough money left over to be able to incentivize his employees. Yes. And it took me about four and a half months to get working with this business owner to, to the point where we got to an incentive dis discussion that I had told him previously. And, you know, it was, wasn't much more um, after that conversation when he said, you know what, now I get it. It really wasn't about me not having the money and not being able to pay him. It was about, I always had the money. I was just managing it incorrectly. Right. And these employees now have stepped up and helped me be more profitable. So if I can share that concept with your listeners. I think that's an important point to make. It is because, you know, that, that another way of kind of wording what you're talking about is just that transition, taking your client from the scarcity mindset to the abundancy and limitless mindset of, I make these changes. And it's not so much that they're giving away money they don't have, it's that they've just completely opened up a whole new direction that's going to bring in more, more liquidity to where then in turn, they can afford all that extra stuff. Augments the business, right. augments the employee portfolio, augments their expanse or footprint, and you have a much more profitable entity to be able to secure your future, which is the key in all of these small business discussions is about mm -hmm. security and understanding that there's investment and value to your investment. So um, kind of looking at uh, other businesses, just in your experience, uh, what would you say uh, are some of the most common reasons that entrepreneurs have, have either failed in their endeavor or just gave up in the process? Most people get burnt out. You know, when, you, when they come into small business owner ownership, uh, a lot of people don't come from business school and decide they want to open a business. They come from the school of hard knocks. They learn a skill or a trade craft better than anybody else. They're, they're passionate about doing the thing that they know oh so well better than the person that they used to work for. Mm -hmm. Because everybody will tell you that story. I used to work for a guy. Yeah. The, the scary part about that story, and I, and, and I always ask this client, I always ask every client the same question. Well, how do you know that you're not that guy for all those people that are leaving you? And it always stops them for a minute because the whole reason why they wanted to open their company was not to be the guy that they used to work for. And, and when they realize, oh my gosh, the turnover that I'm experiencing in my company is a reflection of how I'm managing, what vision I create, what kind of planning do I have and put in place, what kind of control systems or structure do I put in place? You know, these are the things that make a profound impact for small business owners. Now, because they don't le learn business first, they learn their trade first, mm -hmm. that burnout factor for small business owners is usually why companies underperform. Right. The fastest way to go out of business is really twofold. One, you go too fast, it's uncontrolled growth, so you wipe out your remaining cash flow and people don't pay you as fast as you got to pay somebody else to get there. Um, and then rule number two is tight 
financial management control of costs and profitability, engineered profitability, most often is why companies fail because they're not controlling the behavior of their human resources. They're not delivering their product to the bid standard that they put forth. Hence, they're over overrunning their bids and they have a lot of ancillary costs within their business that they don't consider. So all of a sudden, they, they're, they're robbing Pater to pay Paul. Mm -hmm. So if you'll excuse that metaphor, um, it, it, it's a very common place. Those are the two big killers is uncontrolled uncontrolled growth because their cash doesn't convert as fast as they thought it would or bad material practices going on from within a company. And I, I do that for a living, right? I save or turn companies. I would say a full third of what Cogent Analytics does is to implement best practice with companies that are struggling. The other 70% are high performing companies that, you know, the best part about the story is I always get high performing clients that bring us in because they're high performing and they want to do better. Mm -hmm. Our greatest struggle is when clients don't reach out or they're not performing to standard, they seem to be the ones that are more resistant to reach out to us and say, you know what, I want to go through a discovery process. It's always the people that are thinking high performance that actively reach out to us and bring us in proactively. It's, it's the clients that are really struggling when they desperately need assistance and guidance and just wisdom. You know, they're not getting it from their accountant. And they're not getting it from their attorney. Business mm -hmm. professionals exist because we're business professionals, right? right? And, and when you're struggling, if you're having an issue, you're not, you're not in a boat by yourself with one oar rowing around the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. There are resources like Cogent Analytics and it, and I, I mean, you know, maybe I'm my worst shameless plug, but if not Cogent Analytics, please reach out to somebody who can assist you in putting the right structure. If nothing else, do a review with you, turn over every stone, find where the challenges and impingements and problems are mm -hmm. that are slowing down your success rate. And, and above all else, be honest with yourself. That's always the toughest thing for a small business owner because pride enters the discussion. Remember their business is their baby and they work their heart out at making their baby successful and they usually don't want to admit that it's not as successful as they want it to be. There is a good path to health. Right. Sorry, James, another long answer to a very short question. Oh, it's, it's kind of right. And it, it seems really ironic uh, to me at least that the people that, that need, uh, help the most need help from your business or need help from my business are the ones that least ask for it. And then the ones that are asking for the help are the ones that don't need it as much. Uh, Cause they're the proactive thinkers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm always amazed at, you know, the number of people that, you know, when I'm talking to, it's like, yeah, I'll do a financial review for you. You know, absolutely. No, no, no cost, no obligation. You know, let's just look at things, find out where you're at. And they're like, well, I don't, I don't have any money to worry about. It's like, well, you don't have any money to worry about because you haven't done this. It's not that you don't need to do this because you don't have any money. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's a change. Not a chicken and an egg. Yeah, it's an <laughs> epiphany. How can I get you to this epiphany moment? Because, you know, if, if you thought of it from the other direction, you, you would see the logic. So it's always ironic to me that, you know, the ones that really need it the most are the last ones to ask for it. So I've got an old rule, James, that says you swim as hard and as fast as you can. And this is a line, you know, I will pull a line out of a movie, The Guardian. Mm -hmm. um, he says, you know, they ask how, how many times, how, how did he get that many saves, open ocean saves? And he said, it's really simple. I swim as hard and as fast as I can. And I put one person in the basket. And then I just keep swimming until I can't swim any harder. And I would say in your line of business, in my line of business, you, you try to make an impact even for the ones that are hard to get to pay attention because most often those are the ones that need the help the most, as you said, mm -hmm. very eloquently. Um, you know, you, you kind of get addicted. And, and I think from our conversation before, we all get a little addicted when you're in service to others. Mm -hmm. If, if it's, if it's about the money, people are blase and you can tell pretty quickly, you know, spend yeah. five and a half minutes with them and you can smell it on them. Mm -hmm. The, the, the people that are genuine, that are in service to others. I think if you do your due diligence and you get a sense through talking to them that it's, it's genuine, not just a sales pitch, 
then you've probably found an advisor that's good for you and your family. Whether it's you, me, or John Q. Public, who's also doing the same thing you and I do, mm -hmm. I, I think it's important to have a business advisor that can tell you the truth, you know, speak pr truth to power, so to speak. That's right. Well put. <clears throat> now, uh, what, what are some of the roadblocks uh, that you've encountered in your business that you might warn a new entrepreneur about? Um, why don't I answer that question with what I think, instead of personalizing, why don't I answer that question with what I think for new business owners is critical. Sure. Okay. Um, you know, generating revenue, a solid business development strategy. Mm -hmm. And business development is selling and marketing. So you have to consider uh, reviewing all of how you sell or bring your product to market. There are a lot of people who are tradesmen and uh, you know, their idea of selling is when my phone rings. Um, that is definitely not selling behavior. So if you're trying to generate revenue in your business and it's a startup or you're a mature business, maybe you're two, $3 million, but you're not, you know, you've hit that stasis point. Mm -hmm. Selling behavior is an entire area of a company that requires direction. The next piece is people. We call it organizational inter engineering, but building a right leadership structure, making sure that your critical tasks are addressed by people who care about your company, just like you do. Um, the next part of that is process engineering because every company has a way they go about delivering their service offering. And usually you end up with a lot of profit erosion in how that service offering is delivered, whether it's quality control, whether it's material management, whether it's human resource and the delivery of their product or goods, whether it's how they track the, those products or goods, whether it's scheduling, um, if you've got an interaction with other people who are also participating, scheduling becomes critical to avoid lost man hours. And then lastly, make sure please you put appropriate both financial controls and operational controls in place because you cannot manage what you do not measure. Right. And I, I hate to use an old euphemism, but um, it is an absolute, you cannot man manage what you do not measure. Yep. So hopefully that was, hopefully that was helpful, not just talking about Rob Brayman and coaching and analytics, but more from what I think holistically is important to anybody going into business. Yep, that is important, very well, very well said. Uh, are there some resources that you think uh, you might turn people on to being aware of, you know, things such as small business administration score or, or some additional resources that you think would be uh, advantageous? Um, depending on where they are and sorry for the long, um, uh, where people are in their cycle, um, you know, CRM accounting system, uh, process measurement tools, whether that's an ERP system or some form of project management system. Um, and then organizationally, there aren't tools specific, although there are a lot of team development advisors out there that can do any one of a number of reviews. Mm -hmm. You know, we do a discovery process, James. Yeah. And, you know, I don't presume anybody is going to do consulting when we engage them in a discovery. It, it is a, a benefit to those clients when we know there's a clear ROI and we have a partner in a client that we actually can work with because you can't push a rope up a hill, right? right? If there, there's an old joke that we tell in Cogent Analytics is, you know, if a client's rope, you can't push a rope up a hill, um, which is a Southern colloquialism. I don't know whether all your listeners will get it. Uh, we have to have an active participant to be able to take them on into consulting because nobody's going to fix your business more than you are. Right. Even if you don't have the tools to fix it, you're definitely going to drive change because you're the owner. So those are some behaviors but we're looking for. The discovery itself, and I think I'll answer your question this way, our discovery process is two to three days of boots on the ground, holistic view of the entirety of your organization, your processes, your cash management, your financial management, your operational management, your business development, go to market strategy. So when we do a discovery with our clients, it is complete tip to tail, full engagement with leadership all the way down to the last man digging a ditch, if you'll, 
if you'll allow me that latitude, because it's critical. There is nothing more important than occasionally engaging your organization or challenging your organization in thinking about the future, looking at what's happening today and thinking about the future to make, make them embrace, make them see, make them engage. Mm -hmm. Right. Sometimes you got to recalibrate, uh, reload and re-engage in the fond words of Jocko Willink. So how would you say that your, your personal values and beliefs uh, play a role in your business? And then the kind of additive part of the question would be, how would you advise other people to, to incorporate that into their business? Successful people. And, and th this is a crazy percentile. If you look out into the world, you'll find that most successful people have a core set of values that they, they don't, they don't just talk about in a casual way. It's something that they believe to their bone. It's something they embrace at their core and it's more importantly attributes that they lead with every day. Mm -hmm. um, mine are simple and you know, it's the tenets of strength, character and power which are honor, courage, wisdom, faith, perseverance, and loyalty. Um, that is something that is embraced by my entire organization. It's something that I've had in my life for 30 years. And, you know, it's the old adage of honor is, is what you do when nobody's looking. You know, you, you've got to tell the truth. You know, words aren't cheap. Uh, you've got to be honest and honorable in all things you do. Um, courage is the ability to tell the truth when people don't necessarily want to hear it. Mm -hmm. The courage to do the right thing, even when other people find it unpopular. Courage to challenge the status quo, I think is the way I want to say that. Yep. Um, wisdom, I think, you know, the good Lord made you as smart as you were ever going to be the day he made you. Uh, wisdom you have the privilege of having imposed upon you by life every single day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> faith uh, is a personal thing. Mm -hmm. um, for each one of your listeners, your faith, uh, it doesn't matter who you pray to. It matters that you are, you are praying from within, mm -hmm. right? That it's a core value set. Uh, perseverance by, by single definition is the stick to to be able to see your way through tough times because as everyone well knows, life is rarely uh, kitties and kites. Yep. And loyalty, I think is a, I think is an attribute that as long, it seems to have its challenges, right? If you look out of, amongst the world today, the concept of loyalty and, and, and truly understanding the premise of loyalty, whether it be to a client, to a friend, or to a family member, it really is a definition of character that I think goes to how you're built, who you are, and, and what your makeup is. Right. So th those are mine, and I will tell you that's the way we, that's the way we believe every single day. And I, and I'd like to, I'd like to tell you with great confidence that those core value systems have been embraced in my organization. And um, it's the, it's a thing that'll bring a tear to my eye when I'm speaking to my employees at our, at our Christmas party last Friday, you know, it was a moment there where it, it the, the obvious truth of it was that I was no longer the leader of an organization trying to instill values that, they had grown to the point where those values had had then been reflected back to me in the faces of those of those looking back to me when I was talking on Friday night. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if I can tell you from an inspirational standpoint, there has been no greater moment thus far in my life than to to look at those employees and their wives or husbands and their children who were also invited to the get together. Uh, pretty amazing experience, James. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it was. You know, that, that's legacy at, at its finest right there, I think. <clears throat> so um, what is something that early in your life uh, perhaps you did not do or did in a certain way that you would have chosen to have done differently now that you look back at it? So when I was 15 years old, my father passed away. I was a baby of four kids. 
And uh, I always tell it as a bit of a joke, but the, the truth of the matter is I went from who's who National Honor Society to juvenile delinquent in about two and a half seconds. I was mad at the world um, from the time I was a sophomore to the time I graduated high school, if not for football and probably my vice president, uh, my, uh, my vice principal, excuse me, at the time, a gentleman who's now deceased by the name of John Dowling was probably the reason why as a straight A kid, I actually got through high school um, and into college was for the efforts of both, both my athletic participation and a vice president, a principal that actually cared. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I made a boatload of mistakes along the, uh, along that youthful journey that when I look back onto life, um, probably has had an impact in the way I've raised my kids. It's probably had an impact in the way I, I believe in service to others. Um, it's probably why I have more wisdom than I need to have. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's not always the problem. It's, it's the experience that comes with the wisdom that sometimes is a, a bruised toe as it were. From time to time. That's right. But I, I wouldn't, you know, if I had to do it all over again, short, Short of losing my father, I would take that back. Mm-hmm. I would take that back in a heartbeat. If I could have my dad see see his grandkids, how they've grown up today. Yeah. Um, you know, there are plenty of moments when I look at my kids do something amazing, and I, and I wish my father was there to see it. Mm-hmm. But uh, t- truth be told, if I had to do it all over again, I would say it was part of what made me the man I am today as well. So he did his job. He prepared me for life. Yeah. Good stuff. So when, when you're transitioning out of the military, uh, you know, obviously each person uh, transitioning out kind of has their, their own struggles and hurdles they have to deal with. Uh, what was your, your transition story like? Uh, was there difficulties in that as far as going from the, the camaraderie and the brotherhood that we experienced in the service and then coming back to the world to where it's all a whole different universe? Yeah, you, you – you probably have some prior service members listening to this and you're right. We all have a story. Uh, you probably have some guys and gals are about to get out of the military. You know, don't, don't be afraid of the J O B to begin with because you never know what that platform is going to take you. Um, it won't be like it was when you were in where that camaraderie, the esprit de corps, the brotherhood or sisterhood, um, Civilian, the civilian world operates differently. Mm-hmm. Chain of command doesn't quite work the same way. The understanding that an order is actually an order that you have to follow doesn't quite work the same way. Um, the striving for excellence doesn't quite work the same way. But don't give up hope. I think I look, I look under the world and I see a lot of prior service members that are exceptionally successful. Um, and don't get me wrong, you know, we support an organization called Objective Objective Zero. Mm-hmm which is about limiting veteran and current active duty member suicide. You know, we lose a battalion of soldiers every single year to people taking their own lives and the strife that happened both when they were in and the challenges that they're faced once they reach the civilian community. Mm -hmm. And first off, there's a lot of people out there that walked a mile in those shoes before you did. And I guarantee there are people willing to help like an organization like Objective Zero. Mm -hmm. Um, Reach out. There are great programs that will help you get. I mean, if you're really struggling, there will programs that help you get back on your feet. But most for most people, the struggle from military to civilian life transition is it will seem foreign to you for a year. Usually. Um, don't look for that flash in the pan, 30, 60, 90 day magic. You're, you're going to have to figure out that some of that acclimation and change has got to start with you and not necessarily the organi- organization you're joining. I would tell you to continue to outperform mm-hmm. as you were expected in the military, because historically that's why you will rise through a civilian organization is because they recognize that you have all the foundational principles that'll make you successful in theirs. Um, Hopefully that answered your question, James. I think I, I was a little tangential there, but I think I got the message across. Yeah, and you know, you're you're touching on the point of you know outperform you know outperform the other people. Yeah, you know, what the the civilian companies will discover. You know, they may not understand it up front, and may not even want to hire 
you know, our, our listener because they're a veteran, you know, not all companies are, are that way, but what they will discover is that you're going to probably do about 30% more production than their civilian counterpart. And that stuff is going to keep you around and you're going to be able to earn 30% more income than your civilian counterpart. They're going to notice that too. And so, you know, just focusing on, on your core values and just know that they may not, under, may not understand who you are as a veteran, but they can understand what you're doing. And they can, 100% you know, agree. Not going to miss that one. <clears throat> yeah. You know, the fear I think um, for a lot of business owners today is we, we publicize PTSD, which I think is critically important to do for survivors and people have gone through PTSD. But um, what happens is people share those stories and then when they see veteran on an application, they don't know how to handle the questions and they don't know how to engage with somebody who might have been having that experience. Um, you know, if you're, if you're having some challenges, I would say there's nothing wrong with introducing it. Uh, in a discussion, if somebody asks you directly, always be honest, be forthright, be straightforward, mm -hmm. but also give them the confidence. You know, I had a discussion and I, again, another anecdotal story. I had a discussion with a small business owner about two weeks ago that was fearful of hiring a veteran um, because he was a combat veteran and he was a little concerned about PTSD. And I said, well, share with me, what is it about the PTSD that has got you so fearful or uptight. Yeah. And he started to tell a story of, you know, somebody a friend had shared with him. And you always like playing telephone, right? You know, it's the old can story where everybody sits in a circle and by the time it gets back to you. But th this particular business owner was fearful of this, this veteran because they were going through PTSD and maybe they're going to come to work and shoot up the place. And I, and I, and I had to stop my client at that point in time and asked him how many of those stories had he personally been aware of. And when he sat back and thought about it, he realized that the answer to that question was none. Mm -hmm. yep. And I said, well, why is that true for you then? And he said, well, I don't know why it's true for me, but I, I guess I had that fear. So just remember that if you're honest and you're forthright, that most often some of those fears, if you don't introduce it, they may not hire because they're thinking it and move your application to the side out of their own. Right idiosyncratic fear, mm -hmm. not because it's real or, or fact-based. So don't be afraid of being able to address those issues in a positive, uplifting way with your potential hire yeah. or, or the company that may be looking to hire you. Yep. So uh, what, what compelled you uh, to, to go into the direction you did uh, as a business? Was there like a, an I'm, moment that, that told you, you know, you want to go into you know, business consulting? So I built three companies. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I built three companies before this one. Mm -hmm. um, became an, I was going to become another entrepreneur and applied for it. I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and told my wife that I was going to get a, at least the process of, of interviewing for jobs. We'd moved to North Carolina and the bank had that day given me the loan. And um, woke up three o'clock in the morning and I was milling about in the house. And finally, I laid back down in bed and I told my wife, I said, you know, I think I'm going to interview for some jobs. Well, you know, the first thing that came out of her mouth at three o'clock in the morning is, as you can imagine, why am I up at three o'clock in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then she thought about what I had told her and, and she asked me if I was crazy and she knew the answer to that question already. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I said, you know, I've, I've been an entrepreneur for a really long time and I, I don't know what it's like to have a job. So whether it be for three months or a year or two years, I've already got the loan. Nothing's going to stop me from doing it again if, if I, I choose not to go down that path. But I thought it was healthy to interview for some jobs. And I ended up going to work with another consulting group that um, I think taught me more about when I look at cogent analytics, it taught me more about who I didn't want to become mm -hmm. and what value systems I wanted to instill in how we represent our clients. Right. So that's really what drove me is, is I fell, I would say I entered an ad and I fell into a position more than it, 
it more happened to me than me happening to it. But there was a, it would, the ad said, can you work with a, a small business owner? And I said, well, gosh, I am one. So I know I can do that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I answered the ad and I was hired and I worked there for 11 years. And um, wow. I did a lot of great work when I was there, but I could not or no longer support the vision of the organization. Um, and I felt it was, you know, when you get to that point where you can't believe in what you're doing, you gotta, you gotta begin to believe again. Sure. Hence sure. why I built Cogent Analytics. And I, and I attribute most of our success to the fact that we've, we've stayed true to those core values and, uh, I can get up and look myself and shave in the morning with the guy I'm staring back at me. Yeah. That's important. So, uh, for, as a serial entrepreneur, uh, I guess this might be an amusing question. Is there another profession that you would, would like to attempt other than what you're doing? Um, so the last part of Coach and Analytics is going to be private equity mm-hmm. investment into small business owners. I'm, I'm pretty convinced that I will be with the small business community for the balance of however the good Lord wants to leave me in, in, in service of others. Um, eventually he's going to call me to the gate, right? right. So uh, until that point in time, I'm pretty convinced that I am going to be in small business advisory services for the balance of my career. But the last part of the equation is really um, private equity investment in the small business community. Mm-hmm. Um, you'd be shocked at how many great, amazing ideas are out there. You know, people that talk about the American dream being dead haven't, they're obviously not reading the right things or paying attention to the right things because it is alive and well. You know, the American dream is still very, very vibrant and um, look around and ask your employees someday, you know, if they don't believe it's vibrant, uh, you should ask them why not. Mm -hmm. Um, If you don't believe it's uh, it's vibrant, you should look in the mirror and ask yourself, how did you get to there? Because I can promise you the dream is real and it is still, we we still live in the greatest country in the world. And, uh, you know, it's not perfect by any stretch of imagination, right? We have an imperfect system but the American dream is alive. And I think that's critical. Good stuff. So uh, what would you say your, your greatest strength would be character strength? Leadership. I have, um, you know, if I'm going to be fair in that, uh, that was not something I came to of my own accord. That's Mm -hmm. something that other people have, um, most recently written or said about me mm-hmm. is that I effortlessly make them believe in something that they had never considered before and that they, they believe in my servant leadership style it, so much so that I'm, I'm, let me answer it to you this way. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not one of the guys that stands at the top of the hill and yells back down to tell you to run faster. I, I'm the guy, I'm the kind of guy that runs back down the hill to the last guy and says, come on, I'll run with you. Mm-hmm. And, and that tends to be, that tends to be motivating to other people to do those same behaviors, same traits. Sure. So uh, I do it and have done it most of my career without thinking or putting it in context. My employees just impose that upon me. So when you ask the question, I'll give you the answer that they gave. Mm-hmm. Uh, flip side of that uh, question would be, what would you say the greatest weakness is that you have? Um, I'm Don Quixote. <laughs> so for anybody who hasn't read Man of La Mancha, I, I tilt at windmills every day. Mm-hmm. I'm a diehard believer that all things can be accomplished. And in reality, not all can be accomplished. But if you're willing to get up every day and, and you know, put your boots on, strap up and, and get in the game, I think you can accomplish a whole amazing amount, but that just comes from personal strength and fear and, and, and power. So, um, yeah, that's that my, my greatest weakness is I'm Don Quixote. I, I love to tilt at windmills. So uh, when you're doing your brainstorming, uh, is there a special place that you, that you like to go to for brainstorming, you know, you know, taking the dog for a walk or something of that sort? The elliptical. Oh. When I when I, I I used to run I can't with my hips anymore run so if I get on the elliptical I um you know it's the one place I can turn on the music and shut the rest of the world out and nine times out of ten I figure out a bunch of complex problems when I'm 
um, either in the gym or on the elliptical or, you know, that's, that's my special place. I, I would say to shower, but I think that's personal for a podcast. <laughs> I, I think quite a few people, uh, I've had quite a few guests that have claimed shower. So you know, it's, it's safe territory. You know, we're all, we're all, you know, we're all brothers and family here. <laughs> yeah. In a leadership role, you know, the one time that you have that nobody wants a piece of you is you're, you're either, you know, on the commode, you're in the shower or you're, yep. you know, at the gym with your headset on where nobody's going to, you know, reach over and ask you a question. So those are private moments that are, are really for yourself, but yeah, it's healthy. Yep. Do your best thinking there. <clears throat> so if you're to describe, uh, you know, what your, what your day looks like, maybe to someone who wants to start a business, uh, how would you describe your day at a very high level? I, I work, I work half days. Okay. Yeah. Pick whatever 12 hours you want. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, I, I owe you a serious answer. Um, entrepreneurship is incredibly challenging. If you're, if you're thinking about going to small business, um, first off, I would tell you to reach out. You know, we have an exercise that we go through with startup companies mm-hmm. to make sure that they're dotting the I's and crossing the T's. You mentioned SCORE early in our discussion, which is a phenomenal organization. Mm-hmm. Um, there are, SBA has great small business resources mm-hmm. to be able to take you through a well thought out plan if you haven't considered many of the questions. Um, be prepared for the hardships. Usually when you go to work and get a job somewhere, you know, the back office is managed for you. The business development is managed for you. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in a role where you have to go into work every day and focus on the one thing that you do well. In small business owners, small business owners have to consider everything every day. Yes. So there, there's no, there's no pause button. There's no time off, whether it comes to payroll or 941 taxes or the bank that needs information or a vendor that wants you to fill out a credit application or a new hire that, you know, somebody called in sick and didn't show up the fourth day in a row and you got to hire somebody. Mm-hmm. You are the business when you become a small business owner until you build a team around you where your team you know, it, you're, the, you're, the success or failure of your business isn't defined by just you, James. Right. Your business is defined by the team that you build. So there's my there's my um, longer answer. Yeah, and just a, a side note, you know, I wanted to mention since you were mentioning a small business is uh, for our veteran listeners, they're, they're also within the Small Business Administration office is going to be uh, a person or a group of people that work with veterans. And so that's going to be a good, uh, even in uh, all the way up to the level of in DC, in Washington, uh, there, there's a team of veteran business owners that work with the small business administration. And so, you know, you're, you're represented from the highest levels all the way down. And so, you know, reach into that resource and, and take advantage of Please. it because I mean, it's, it's there for you. You've earned it. So that's my little side note to, to small business is, you know, take full advantage of it. And the um, the Inc. 5000 has a program for all of you people coming up. The Inc. 5000 has a program every year where they do a veteran mentorship program, Mm -hmm. which is actually how I met Objective Zero. Um, I met the principals of Objective Zero at the Inc. 5000 two years ago, and uh, they were my mentee. I was their mentor. Um, It didn't start out that way. My mentee was unable to attend and their mentor was hung up in a storm and not able to travel. So I was, it it was divine intervention. I was blessed with the opportunity to meet Justin Miller and then Blake Bassett. Um, Phenomenal organization, www.objectivezero.org. For all you veteran listeners, please go on. Um, There is no higher honor than getting our brothers and sisters to um, maybe we can help them from taking their own life. So if you can participate, they definitely need ambassadors. It is a, it is a wonderful program. Sorry for the second shameless plug oh, of the day. No, no worries. You know, I, for, for all of the, the different organizations helping our veterans, you know, I, I'm, I'm a hundred percent you know on board with that. So no worries on that. Uh, so as the, the final question for you, Rob, 
and it's kind of my my trivia question that I throw at the very end. Uh, if you can tell some tell us something about you that most people don't know about you. Oh, good lord! You know, it's a, you know what the problem with that question is, James, is that? that you know everything that you know about you, and you're not quite sure what everybody else doesn't know about you. So. Um, <laughs> I, I will tell you that I'm a, I'm a husband of 24 years and madly in love with my wife, although I think everybody knows that. i madly in love with my kids. My son is a, a junior at VMI. He's a second Virginia Military Institute. My daughter's a, an up-and-coming engineer, um, and she's in her sophomore year. I, I have a very insular family that I, I put above all else. Um, I'm I'm a, a diehard believer in the goodness of people, even when occasionally they prove me wrong. Um, I get up every morning believing in the goodness of people because that's a. I think that's the only way you can live your life and not become jaded. You know, don't get wrapped up in the people that want to pro prove you wrong. Uh, get wrapped up in the people that prove you right every day, and I think you'll have a a much more enriching life. So I don't know whether everybody knows that about me. I am, uh, I'm, I'm a, a, a dad who loves his kids. I'm a husband who madly in love with his wife. I'm a, a business owner that has greatest and utmost respect for his people and the hard work that they put in every day. I'm, I'm passionate about my clients and what I have the privilege of doing every day. Um, those I think are the knowns. Um, believing in believing in the goodness of mankind i think is you know goes to the don quixote story and i don't think i'll change that for anybody no and you know the way i the way i see that you know kind of a, another interpretation is you know we're all created in god's image and so when you look for for that in other people then you won't be disappointed so that's, that's good stuff but rob uh you know i've i've enjoyed having you on the program it's been you know again a pleasure and honor to have you here uh, before uh, before we part, I want to give you a chance to to give some contact methods for for the listeners, so if they can reach out to you uh, through you know either your business or uh, any personal contact things you know like social media that you do or or even some of the programs that you're involved with, uh, different contacts for them. Just give you a chance to put that in there. Yeah, please. And we have bunches and bunches and bunches of resource. If you go to the www cogenanalytics.com website and you look at our resource page we have blogs we have white papers we have case studies we have articles that have been published uh, i think we're over a dozen uh, published articles mm -hmm. we have any one of a number of podcasts we have resources for you the small business owner that you know reach out to us if you want to go through that i'll make this i'll make your listeners the same offer um, we've actually been very successful with this program. Somebody else told me I should do it about six months ago, and it's been amazing how much buy-in that we've gotten from listeners over the time of doing podcasts. But we will do a two- to three-day discovery of your business for $1,200 for the first 10 listeners. And I'm, and I'm not meaning to make that sound cheesy. The last podcast we did, we did 14 of them because I – Again, I'm Don Quixote and I don't know how to say no, but you know, if you own a small business and you have not been through the process of a holistic review of your business, please take us up on this, www.coachinganalytics.com. You can sign up for our newsletter, which always has great content. Please follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, we're always putting out business intelligence, and if you want to participate in the discovery, send me a personal note. Um, you can send it either to info or at support um, at cogenanalytics.com, and you will have a phone call within 24 hours of sending that from either myself personally or somebody else in my um, team that you know, we'll talk through the issues with you, get a sense of what you're going through, and we will schedule with you. That discovery is $1,200 for two to three days of holistic review of your entirety of your business. And I will, whether you're a $2 million company, a million dollar company, or a $20 million company, to me, it's the opportunity to prove our wares. So 
Again, www.coachinganalytics.com. Please give us a shout. Excellent. That's good stuff, Rob. And you know, I certainly encourage the listeners to take you up on that because you know, it's, it's like they say, you, you don't know what you don't know and you can't fix what you don't see. So certainly, you know, take them up on that because, you know, $1,200 for looking your business over beginning to end, that's, you know, it's still. Yeah, and we have probably 80s. If you have some trepidation, we have 80 plus video testimonials on our website that, you know, pick a couple off listen to them. I think you'll probably see yourself through their stories. Right. But uh, I always like one of the clients. I, I suck at, uh, I think, telling our story. I, that, that's why we invest so much in clients mm -hmm. telling the story as it related for them. So if you have some fears or trepidations, go watch some of the client videos. If you see yourself in that, please reach out and it would be an honor. And James, thank you, by the way, for having me on. Today. Well, thank you, sir. And yeah, you know, I, I certainly wish you the best of luck with your business and, you know, being, being back on the Inc. 1000 again for another year, you know, coming up. So, you know, certainly, you know, say congratulations on that. And, you know, until next time, I'll see you around the bend, my friend. It was a pleasure. Thanks again. Thank you, sir. You've been listening to Legacy Cast. Thank you for joining us today and be sure to come back next time as we speak with more top influencers, industry experts, and business owners from around the world.